Welcome to Walker of Worlds podcast. My name's Rachel and this is the podcast where we step behind the veil and take a look at some little known and long lost urban legends and spooky stories. In recent months, the Hellfire Club has become synonymous with season four of Stranger Things. Like many things within the Stranger Things universe, the term is borrowed from other sources. A lot of the show is based on conspiracy theories, urban legends and things that happened in real life. The Hellfire Club is one of those things that happened in real life and this is the story of its origins. So Hellfire Club was known for several exclusive clubs for high society hellraisers established in Britain and Ireland in the 18th century. The name most commonly refers to Francis Dashwood's Order of the Friars of St Francis of Wickham. Such clubs, rumour had it, served as the meeting places of persons of quality who wished to take part in what was socially perceived as immoral acts and the members were often involved in politics. Neither the activities nor membership of the clubs are easy to ascertain, but we can assume that such acts included sexual, possibly homosexual acts, drinking, magic and general debauchery. The clubs allegedly had distant ties to an elite society known only as the Order of the Second Circle. The first Hellfire Club was founded in London in 1718 by Philip, Duke of Wharton and a handful of other high society friends. The most notorious club associated with the name was established in England by, obviously, Francis Dashwood and met irregularly from around 1749 to around 1760 and possibly up until 1766. In its later years, the Hellfire Club was closely associated with Brooks, established in 1764. Other groups using the name Hellfire Club were set up throughout the 18th century. Most of these clubs arose in Ireland after Wharton's had been dissolved. The defining period of the Hellraiser, also known as Rakes, was at the court of Charles II in the late 17th century. Dubbed the Merry Gang by poet Andrew Marvel, their members included King Charles himself, George Villas, 2nd Duke of Buckingham, John Wilmot, 2nd Earl of Rochester, Sir Charles Sedley, Charles Sackville, 6th Earl of Dorset, and a number of playwrights. Following the tone set by the monarch himself, these men distinguished themselves in drinking, womanising and witty conversation, with the Earl of Rochester out doing all the rest. Many of them were gamblers and brawlers, some were also duelists, but not with the approval of King Charles, who discouraged the practice of duelling. Highlights of their careers include Sedley and the Earl of Dorset preaching naked to a crowd from an alehouse balcony in Covent Garden as they simulated sex with each other, and the low light was Buckingham's killing of Francis Tolbert, 11th Earl of Shrewsbury, in a duel for the latter's wife. In 1682, Thomas Wharton, 5th Baron of Wharton, broke into a church at night and relieved himself against the communion table and in the pulpit. A later group of aristocratic rakes were associated with the Hellfire Club in the 18th century. These included Francis Dashwood and John Wilkes. Francis Dashwood, whose variation of the Hellfire Club is deemed to have been the most well-known, was born in Great Marlborough Street, London in 1708. He was the only son of Sir Francis Dashwood, first baronet, died in 1724, and his second wife, Mary, who was the eldest daughter of Verfane, 4th Earl of Westmoreland. Francis and Mary had two children, a son Francis and a daughter Rachel. Sir Francis also had two surviving daughters from his first marriage and two daughters and two sons from his third. Sir Francis Dashwood had a sister Rachel and six half-siblings. Dashwood was educated at Eton College where he became associated with William Pitt the Elder. Upon the death of his father on the 4th of November 1724, Dashwood, who was only 15, inherited his father's estates. Dashwood spent his youth in early adulthood abroad, gaining a reputation for notoriety while travelling around Europe. He impersonated Charles XII while in Russia and attempted to seduce Rena Anne and later expelled from the Papal States. His sojourns abroad did also include classical aspects of the European Grand Tour. After travelling to France and then returning via Germany to England between January and September 1726, he did not venture abroad again until 1729, when he was away for two years, returning in 1731. During this time abroad, he visited Italy, where he stayed in Rome and visited excavations at Herculeanum. While in Italy, he befriended the philosopher Antonio Nicolini in 1733. Between the visits to Italy, Dashwood, accompanied by George Lord Forbes, to St. Petersburg, stopping on the way at Copenhagen, in his opinion of Patrick Woodland, the author of his biography, his intelligent and discriminating diary of this expedition offers important first-hand descriptions of both capitals at this date. Dashwood was too young to have been a member of the very first Hellfire Club, founded by Philip, Duke of Wharton in 1719 and disbanded in 1721, but he and John Montague, first Earl of Sandwich, were alleged to have been members of a Hellfire Club that met at the George and Vulture Inn throughout the 1730s. 
according to the 1779 book Nocturnal Revels on the Grand Tour, he had visited various religious seminaries, founded as it were in direct contradiction to nature and reason. On his return to England, he thought that a burlesque institution in the name of St Francis would mark the absurdity of such societies, and in lieu of the austerities that were practised, substitute convivial gaiety, unrestrained hilarity and social felicity. The first meeting of the group, known as Brotherhood of St Francis of Wickham, Order of Knights of West Wickham, was held at St Francis's family home in West Wickham on Walpurgis Night in 1752. The initial meeting was something of a failure and the club subsequently moved meetings to Medmanham Abbey, about six miles from West Wickham, where they called themselves the Monks of Medmanham. About 1755, Dashwood founded the famous Hellfire Club, or Monks of Medmanham Abbey. Medmanham and Abbey, formerly belonging to the Cistercian Order, was beautifully situated on the banks of the Thames near Marlow, Buckinghamshire. It was rented from Francis Duffield by Dashwood, his half-brother, Sir John Dashwood King, his cousin, Sir Thomas Stapleton, Philip Whitehead, John Wilkes and the others, to the, num- to the number of 12 who frequently visited there during the summer. They had it rebuilt by the architect Nicholas Revelt in the style of the 18th century Gothic revival. It is thought that Hogarth may have executed the murals for this building. None, however, survive. Can you keep up with who's who in this tale? Because I could tell you I flipping can't. Over the grand entrance was placed in stained glass the famous inscription. Fay C.K. Vaudrus. The monks were called Franciscans from Dashwood's Christian name and they amused themselves with obscene parodies of Franciscan rituals and with orgies of drunkenness and debauchery which even John Alman himself, no prude, shrank from. Dashwood, the most profane of the blasphemous crew, acted, acted as sort of a high priest and used communion cup to pour out liberations to heathen deities. He had not even the excuse of comparative youth to play his conduct. He was approaching 50 and was 10 years older than Thomas Potter, whom Almond describes as the worst of the set and the corrupter of Wilkes. He was nearly 20 years older than Wilkes and two years older than the aged Paul Whitehead, who acted as secretary and steward of the Order of Ill Fame and was branded by Charles Churchill as a disgrace to manhood. As a contrast, to Medmanham Abbey, Dashwood erected a church on a neighbouring hill which, as Churchill put it in the ghost, might serve for show if not for prayer. And Wilkes was equally caustic in his references to Dashwood's church built on the top of a hill for the convenience and devotion of the town at the bottom of it. The downfall of Dashwood's club was drawn out and complicated in 1762. The Earl of Butte appointed Dashwood his Chancellor of the Exchequer, despite Dashwood being widely held to be incapable of understanding a bill, a bar bill of five figures. Dashwood resigned the post in the next year, having raised a tax on cider which caused near riots. Dashwood now sat in the House of Lords after taking up the title of Baron Lee Dispenser after the previous holder died. Then there was the attempted arrest of John Wilkes for libel against the King in the notorious issue of number 45 of his The North Britain in early 1763. During a search authorised by a general warrant, possibly set up by Sandwich who wanted to get rid of Wilkes, a version of the essay on woman was discovered set up on the press of a printer whom Wilkes had almost certainly used. The work was almost certainly principally written by Thomas Potter and, from internal evidence, can be dated to around 1755. It was blasphemous, libelous and bawdy, though not pornographic, still unquestionably illegal under the laws of the time, and the government subsequently used it to drive Wilkes into exile. Between 1760 and 1765, Adventures of a Guinea by the Irish author Charles Johnston was published. It contained stories easily identified with Medmanham, one in which... Lord Sandwich was ridiculed as having mistaken a monkey for the devil. This book sparked the association between the Medmanham monks and the Hellfire Club. By this time, many of the friars were either dead or too far away for the club to continue as it did before. Medmanham fin- was finished by 1766. Paul Whitehead had been the secretary and steward of the order at Medmanham. When he died in 1774, as his will specified, his heart was placed in an urn at West Wickham. It was sometimes taken out to show visitors, but was stolen in 1829. 
The West Wickham Caves in which the Friars met are now a tourist site known as the Hellfire Caves. In Scotland, a like-minded sex and drinking club called the Beggar's Benison was formed in the 1730s, which survived for a century and spawned additional branches in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Honorary membership was extended to the Prince of Wales in 1783. 39 years later, while the Prince by now King George IV was paying a royal visit to Scotland, he bequeathed the club a snuff box filled with his mistress's pubic hair. So, most people want to know about the West Wickham Caves, also known as the Hellfire Club. They are now a tourist attraction, approximately 35 miles northwest of London. The caves were excavated between 1748 and 1752 for use by Dashwood. The unusual design of the caves was much inspired by Sir Francis Dashwood's visits to Italy, Greece, Turkey, Syria, other areas of the Ottoman Empire during his Grand Tour. The caves extend approximately 400 metres underground, with the individual caves or caves or chambers connected by a series of long narrow tunnels and passageways. A route through the underground chambers proceeds from the entrance hall to the steward's chamber and Whitehead's cave through Lord Sandwich's circle named after John Montague, Franklin's cave named after Benjamin Franklin, a friend of Dashwood who visited High Wycombe, visited West Wycombe sorry, Banqueting Hall allegedly the largest man-made chalk cave in the world, the triangle to the miner's cave and finally across a subterranean river named the Styx lies the final cave the inner temple where the meetings of the hellfire club are held and which is said to lie 300 feet directly beneath the church on top of west wickham hill in greek mythology obviously the river Styx separated the mortal world from hades and the subterranean position of the inner temple directly beneath saint lawrence's church was supposed to signify heaven and hell the caves have been operating as a tourist attraction since 1863 and in World War II, plans were made to use the caves as an air raid shelter should the nearby towns be bombed. Thankfully, Buckinghamshire is pretty rural, so this plan was never put into place. Montpellier Hill in County Dublin, Ireland, is the location of another branch of the Hellfire Club. The rustic-looking hunting lodge was built on top of the 383-metre-high hill in 1725 by William Connolly. Both the hill and the hunting lodge have taken the name Montpellier Hill as well as the Brass Castle and Bevans Hill and both are now known locally as the Hellfire Club. The area is also associated with a number of paranormal events of which we'll get into in a moment. The Hellfire Club at Montpellier Hill was active between 1735 and 1741. Stories of wild behaviour and debauchery and occult practices and demonic manifestations have become part of the local lore over the years. When the lodge was damaged by fire, the members of the Hellfire Club relocated down the hill to the nearby steward's house for a brief period. The building also has a reputation for being haunted, most notably by a massive black cat. While the building has a rough appearance today, the architecture is of a Palladian design. The upper floor consists of a hall and two reception rooms. On the eastern side, there was a third timber-floored level where the sleeping quarters were located. On the ground floor are kitchen, servants' quarters and stairs to the upper floors. The entrance, which is on the upper floor, was reached by a long flight of stairs which is now missing. At each side of the building is a room with a lean-to roof which may have been used to stable horses. A stone mounting block to assist people onto their horses can be seen on the eastern side. To the front there was a semi-circular courtyard enclosed by a low stone wall and entered by a gate. The house faces to the north looking over Dublin and the plains of Meath and Kildare, including Connolly's primary residence at Castleton House in Selbridge. The grounds around the lodge consisted of a 1,000 acre deer park. The identity of the architect is unknown. The author Michael Fewer has suggested it may have been Edward Lovett Pierce, who was employed by Connolly to carry out works at Castleton in 1724. There was a prehistoric burial site at the summit of Mount, Pel Mount Pelier Hill and stones from it were used in the construction of the lodge. A nearby standing stone was also used for a lintel over the fireplace. Shortly after its completion, a great storm blew the original slate roof off. Local superstition held that this was the work of the devil, an act of revenge for disturbing the ancient area. Connolly had the roof replaced with an arched stone roof construction in a similar fashion to that of a bridge. This roof has remained intact to the present day, even though the building has been ab abandoned for over two centuries. And despite the roof being set alight with tar barrels during the visit of Queen Victoria to Ireland in 1849. There is little evidence that the lodge was put to much use, and Connolly himself died in 1729. It is not clear to what extent, if any, the Hellfire Club made use of the building. 
The author Michael Fury suggested that the remoteness of Mount Pelly's location is why there are almost no verifiable accounts of the activities that went on there. However, numerous and very doubtful stories surrounding the building have become part of local folklore, some of which have spread to a wider audience through publication in the 19th century books, such as Robert Chambers's Book of the Days in 1864 and The Gentleman's Magazine, which ran between 1731 and 1922. One of the best-known stories of these tales of a stranger who arrived at the club on a stormy night invited in he joined the members in a card game one player dropped his card on the floor and when he bent under the table to retrieve it he noticed that the stranger had cloven hooves at this point the visitor disappeared in a ball of flame the story which is found in texts from at least the 1930s is very very similar to one associated with loftus hall county rexford the loftus family owned a hunting lodge known as dolly mount which was also to be found on mount pellier Another story centres on club member Simon Luttrell, who was the one-time Sheriff of Dublin and also the Earl of Carhampton. Luttrell is believed to have been the subject of the Diaboloid, a 1777 poem dedicated to the worst man in England. According to the story, Luttrell made a pact with the devil to give up his soul within seven years in return for settling his debts. But when the devil came to Mount Pellier Lodge to claim his prize, Luttrell distracted the devil and fled. The Irish Hellfire Club was revived in 1771 and was active for a further 30 years. Its mo- most notorious member was Thomas Book Whaley, son of Richard Chappelle Whaley. This new incarnation was known as the Holy Fathers. Meetings once again took place at Mount Pellier Lodge and according to one story the members kidnapped, murdered and ate a farmer's daughter. Whaley eventually repented and when he died in 1800 the Irish Hellfire Club disbanded with his death. Mount Pellier Lodge aka the Hellfire Club is now abandoned and burnt out. The result of a fire which was supposedly caused by the members of the club themselves as well as the roof being set alight by blazing tar barrels during Queen Victoria's visit. People are encouraged to visit and while there is little to no public transport in the area there is a car park which is open until 5pm during the winter and 9pm in the summer. The Hellfire Club is approximately 14 kilometres south of Temple Bar in Dublin and is according to reviews and tour videos well worth a visit. If nothing else the views from the top of the hill are simply stunning. Just keep an eye out for that big black cat that is reported to haunt the area. And that, my friends, is the story of the Hellfire Club, from drunkenness and debauchery in the 18th century to Dungeons and Dragons in the 21st. If you like your books a little strange with a touch of the paranormal, please do feel free to check out our website at www.roswellpublishing.co.uk. And until next time, stay spooky.